We said last time we could do the reverse problem instead of saying what's the sine at an angle, saying what angle has that sine in the following manner. It's, it's important you remember the concept because we're going to do it for all the other three questions today. Morning. Um, here's the idea. There's the, the uh, natural sine function across the axis, every pi unit. Do an important number of pi units. Uh, and uh, has peaks and valleys at odd moments of pi over 2. We said that's not an invertible function. It's not 1 to 1. So what did we do? We took the longest piece of it we could near the origin, this part, and said that part is 1 to 1. So we can flip it over the line y equals x gets here, which is about like this, just about hand foot. And if we flip it the other way, it looks about like that. And each point actually lands the same distance across this line, y equals x. What we're doing is we're taking that piece and flipping it over the line y equals x, interchanging the x and y axes, which means that every point a, b on here becomes a point b, a on here. This point 0, pi over 2, for instance, since we flipped it, becomes pi over 2, 0. 0, 0 goes to itself by interchanging the coordinates. And this point here, minus pi over 2, minus 1, I should mark this, shouldn't I? Becomes the point. Minus one minus pi over two. That tells you immediately some values of the inverse sine you can memorize. So this red one is part of the curve y equals sine x. So the whole curve is the white one. And this, by flipping over the line y equals x, is what we call the arc sine or inverse sine. We use both names; they mean the same thing. There it is. So now we said that we can then evaluate the inverse sine for certain angles if x is the sine of a special angle meaning a multiple of 30 or 45 degrees we can find arc sine x, what special angle have that sign, by hand exactly. And I'll ask you to do this on the next test. It's an important problem. I see it all the time in higher mathematics. We can say, for instance, uh, what is the arc sine of square root 3 over 2? How about that? What is that equal to? You interpret as asking, uh, what is the angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 such that, let's see if I'm getting staying on the board here, just barely, such that the sine of theta is equal to that number, square root 3 over 2. I notice that the square root of 3 over 2 looks familiar. It's the sine of some special angle. I just have to figure out what it is. So if the arc sine is taken of plus or minus a half, plus or minus square root of 2 over 2, plus or minus square root of 3 over 2, plus or minus 1 or 0, you recognize all those come from special angles. And you figure them out in the unit circle with this question. What angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 has, that, has this sign? There's an infinite number of angles, actually, that have sine equals square root of 3 over 2, but the inverse sine or arc sine is the one that gives you between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, because that, after all, is the points it goes between, right? It goes up here to pi over 2, because we found this point pi over 2, 0 is the highest. It goes down to minus pi over 2, because we found this point minus pi over 2 is the lowest. That is, if you look at the green curve, which is the arc sine, 
Uh, because we flip this curve, here are the y coordinates and the red one are between plus and minus one. So when we flip it, the uh, x coordinates go between plus and minus one, right? That's why this is coordinate minus one for x. And uh, I write that backwards. I wrote, trying to talk while I wrote, this is the point pi over two, one. <laughs> Think about what I wrote. Uh, all right, pi over two, one, and then you reverse it and get one pi over two, my apologies. And so these, this, is a, this is a point on the sign, this is a point on the inverse side. This is a point on the sign, this is a point on the inverse side. And so the highest point it goes to is one, the lowest uh, is pi over two, the y coordinate, the lowest point is minus pi over two, and it goes between x equals minus one and x equals one. But because, because of that, we say it's domain. All values of x you can put in is just x between minus one and one. That's all the points that are plotted when we put in, right? But the range, all the y values that can come out. Well, I can go between minus pi over two and pi over two. Okay. If the range is that, that's, those are the only y values that can come out. It's giving you the angle within its range that has that sign. That's what it's doing, right? So we put that on the unit circle, we said, and say the sign is the y coordinate of the unit circle. So we want a y coordinate equals square root of three over two. Well, square root of three over two is 0. 0.8 something. It's way up here, almost a one. Since it's not to one, it cuts the unit circle. When it cuts the circle, it intersects at two points, exactly. That means there's only two possible terminal rays to get that y coordinate, right? On the unit circle. Which means that there's only two terminal rays for the angle to get there. The, we're asking what angle has one of these terminal rays then that's between minus pi over two and pi over two, that's plus or minus 90 degrees in here. Can't be this one, it's in the wrong quadrant. We get an angle in quadrant four or one and that's it. It must be this one right here. And when we drop the perpendicular, since this goes up to square root of three over two, this side length is square root of three over two. Uh, this one's one because it's a unit circle. And then the Pythagorean theorem says, we know this one, it's square root of hypotenuse squared minus leg squared. You'll get a half. Once you know two sides of uh, a right triangle, the third side is determined by the Pythagorean theorem and it will be a half. We've already seen that triangle before. We recognize that triangle, that's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. This angle must be pi over 3, 60 degrees. So the answer to this question is pi over 3 if you do your answer on radians, or 60 degrees if you do it in degrees. There's how we found the arc sign. We just asked the reverse question. One angle has that sign, but it has to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. We can solve it on the unit circle. It works every time for numbers that come from special angles. For x not the sign of a special angle. Now what do we do? Just run to the calculator, that's all we can do. Well, so we'll say get a calculator approximation. And the calculator can output it either in degrees or radians. You better make sure it's in the right mode, right? Uh, for example, what is the inverse sine uh, of 0 0.7? 0 0.7 isn't from a special angle, right? It's not plus or minus one, plus or minus square root of three over two, plus or minus square root of two over two, plus or minus a half or zero. 
So we say I didn't come from a special angle, I'll just use my calculator. And here's how you do it. I brought the calculator this morning. Typically, a calculator you use this. Second, or sometimes it's FCN for function, sine key. Because calculators normally put the inverse function above the function itself. You'll see on some of your TI calculators, x squared. Up above it will be the square root that undoes the square, right? Just so above the sine key is the inverse sine key. And so when this is in blue or yellow or something, on this calculator it's in blue, then, then this instruction up here, arc sine, is in blue. So you put blue here, and that enables the blue instruction above the key. Second sign puts inverse sign on your screen. And it normally inserts two parentheses, or if you have an old calculator like this, it may only insert one and you have to close it. Second sign, point seven, close parentheses if necessary, enter. This old TI actually only inserts one parenthesis, but if you push enter, it automatically closes all parentheses, so it works for this thing. Um, here's all the key things you need, and what do we get out of that? Well, second sign, 0.7, enter is 0.7753. And a bunch of other things. Nine, seven, blah, blah, blah. There in decimal form is a good approximation, right? Wait, so is this is for de wait, is this for degrees or radians? That, oh, you stole my thunder there. Yeah. It looks like it's probably for radians because it's small. If it's degrees, it's unlikely I get such a small number of degrees. This will be in radians. That was, that was my next question is the degrees or radians. Look at your calculator. If the calculator is in radians mode, it'll come out in radians. That's what this is. Uh, if your calculator is in degrees mode, then it'll give you the degrees out. Mm -hmm. no, okay, and but how do we know which one to use? Uh, just whichever one I ask for <laughs> on the test. In practice, what happens is something like uh, uh, a surveyor probably wants it in degrees. You know, it's more intuitive. Military, they may want it in degrees or grads or something. But a mathematician usually wants it in radians because it's more natural in things like calculus. It avoids a conversion factor every time. If you're doing arc lengths, you usually want radians, remember, because arc length is R times theta and radians over. So those kind of things. It depends on the application is the answer. Mathematics, usually radians. Things that are visual, astronomy, surveying, that kind of thing, you usually want degrees. Latitudes and longitudes, usually degrees. All right, so that's mostly review, but we really have to have that to be able to understand the next part now. Because we want to do this for the other trig function, right? Two here, we'll say similarly for the cosine. We can find the inverse. So here's the graph of the cosine function. It's the same shape, but it starts at the top. This is the same shape we call them both sine waves, we said. How should we find a piece of this that's invertible? This is 2 pi here. It completes one period from top all the way to the bottom of the top. Here's pi when it's halfway. It crosses at pi over 2 and at 3 pi over 2. And it goes between plus and minus 1. I can't take a symmetric interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 anymore. All right? It won't pass the horizontal line criterion for one of one functions, right? So instead, I'll take this piece going from uh, 0 to pi. This is why I wrote memorized that it's hard to you always get it mixed up with 0 to pi sine or cosine, right? But if you see the picture, then it's obvious, right? So you take the interval from zero to pi and take that piece and no horizontal line intersects that more than once. So you flip that over the line y equals x, which interchanges the coordinates. Now you get something that looks like this. Forgot the other lesson for the course, I always plan ahead, I still have more room. Uh, 
by signifying some points. This point zero one, right? The cosine of zero is one. We're doing this in radians, by the way. Clear through here. I won't normally ask for degrees in this class because it's a math class, but maybe once in the test or something. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, zero one here means that the corresponding point one zero has to be on the inverse cosine. I know similarly that the cosine of pi is minus one. That means the point minus one pi is on the inverse cosine. This point here where it crosses is pi over two. I've got pi over two zero. So it crosses the, the arc cosine crosses the y-axis is zero pi over two. So there's the graph of y equals inverse cosine x also known as y equals arc cosine x, means the same thing. Just for your information, in really old books, you may see a difference of notation for all these functions, actually. When you see this in really old books, you'll see y equals arc cosine x with a capital C. That means you just take this piece, and then if you see y equals arc cosine x with a little c, it doesn't mean actually a function, it means what we call a multi-value function that takes this whole thing and flips it. So it's not a function anymore because it fails the vertical line test, it's what we call a multi-value function. And this will be with a little c, this is a big c. If you see a really old book, don't let it confuse you, this notation is pretty much gone. When you see little arc cosine of x, it just means this one. Uh, so I almost hate to show you that, but just in case you run into it. What are some of these used bookstores anymore? You still see some of those old blank things. You know what's really fun is going to one of these old used bookstores and you see a, a book of five place logarithms. <laughs> you know, what, what a disaster that is, right? That goes back to like the 1960s or something like that when you didn't have a calculator. So you could estimate on your slide rule logarithms, but you'd like to get one or two decimal places. So you get five place logarithms, you can look up logarithms in a book. What a mess, you know, now that book is worthless. All you gotta do is put log number and get it on your calculator in a few seconds. And, but uh, they have old things like that in bookstores and they have these, also in old bookstores, capital C R cosine for this one that we're plotting and, and have a, this little letter C means something else. Anyway, just for your education, it's interesting to know. Uh, when I was a student, I used to see that. So uh, here's a, uh, here's the arc cosine function then. And you notice what it is, what is its domain? That is, what are all x values you can put into it? It's easy to say, where are the x coordinate plotted? The smallest one, you know, about one, yeah. The smallest one is x equals minus one right here. Right? And the biggest one is out here when x equals one. And you can put any number in between and get one of these points, but that's it. Why would it have such a small domain? Right? Well, it's because the y coordinates used to be minus between minus one and one. When you flip it, now the x coordinates are between minus one and one. It's because it's the inverse of a function, right? If, if you if the cosine can only Output a cosine value between minus one and one, and you say what angle has that cosine? All you can get is a value between minus. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. And then you say what angle has that cosine? You can only do it from numbers between minus one and one because your cosine, right? This wave only goes between plus and minus one. You can't have the cosine equal two or something. All right. So then, what's the range? That's all the y values that might come out. Well, the smallest y is zero. And the biggest y is pi, just looking at the endpoint. So zero less than the y less than the pi. There's the domain and range for that function. And it's exactly the same shape as this piece of the cosine. I put up from Wikipedia, I always think that's a good thing to go look because I'll have a short blur that sort of gives you the, the big picture. I like that about Wikipedia. And there's some other good sources too, but these are often written by people in academia. Uh, and so they have a book kind of approach like this. Here's an accurate picture of arc sine that looks like that. Here's an accurate picture of arc cosine that looks like that. 
And so you can look that up. But if you ever feel like you're getting kind of lost on these inverse trig functions, just Google Wikipedia, arc cosine, look up, and it'll, it'll go through a just short, so you sort of an overview of what it's used for and why it's useful. And that's always kind of nice. It's kind of like I told one of my classes this semester already. Uh, when you go to put together a model car or something, and you got to glue all the pieces together with that little model glue. It's nice to have a picture to know what it's supposed to look like beforehand, right? That really helps you put the piece together. And so it does with us too. If you know what our arc signs are used for and where they're going, and you see their pictures, then, then when you see this in class, it all makes a lot more sense. So uh, I'm trying to give you a big picture here, but you might take a look at some of those on lots of the topics too. Same thing with the uh, graphs of sine and cosine and the other functions. You can look in there and get a synopsis. So there's the domain and range of the arc cosine. All right, uh, and then we can do the same kind of problems we did for there. We have this kind of thing, just like I didn't repeat it this time, but the sign, the, by its definition, the sine on the arc sine undoes the sine, so the arc cosine undoes the cosine. The arc cosine of cosine of x ought to be what? Ought to be x. It's an inverse function, right? Remember the for inverse functions, f inverse of f of x is equal to x, always. Why isn't this one always equal to x? Because it's not the inverse of a whole cosine function, it's only the inverse of this piece. So it dutifully does that for this piece, 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi, because it's an inverse function for that part. But this, this naming it that way is sort of a misname, uh, misnomer as they call it. Because it's only an inverse for part of the function. The whole function doesn't have an inverse function. So we'll say you get something else if you put in another, another angle. We're going to talk about what that angle is shortly, next time probably. But it inverts the peak the, of the angle, inverts the cosine for this list of angles that we flipped. Similarly, they have to be inverse of each other. So cosine of the inverse cosine of x has to be that, right? And now we're in better shape because the whole inverse cosine function flipped is part of the cosine function. I should have written this on here. This is y equals cosine x. Um, so it's good. It, it, every point of it is inverted, but alas, it's only defined between minus one and one. So we'll say for all those things for which it's defined, cosine inverse is inverse cosine, but it's undefined otherwise. Had a similar result for sine last time. Which means that for this problem, I don't necessarily need a special angle. If I were to ask you what is the inverse cosine of the cosine of point two, what's that immediately? Point two, uh, because point two is between zero and three point one four pi, right? So you know it doesn't matter; it's not a special angle. The inverse cosine does the cosine. How about the cosine? So the inverse cosine of minus 0.5. What's that? This is minus 0.5. They undo each other whenever they're defined, right? So it's because minus 0.5 is between minus 1 and 1, where it always inverts it. So these having these pictures in your mind, as you can see, really helps you to figure this kind of stuff out. Uh, um, would you mind shifting the camera slightly over? To the right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right, so that's the cosine and the arc cosine. Now you're just probably saying, wait a minute, we got four more functions to go. <laughs> uh, the good news is that for inverse trig functions, mostly people are only interested in 
inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. The other three are useful, and we're going to present them briefly, but they're not used very often. So this last, this next one is actually the last big one. For uh, tangent x, we have this picture. Remember, it has asymptotes at x equals minus pi over 2 and x equals pi over 2. And it goes through this point if you like uh, to plot an extra point here just to see how steep it is. Pi over 4, 1. This would be about 1 here. Uh, and then it repeats over and over, right? It has, it crosses the x axis at integer multiples of pi 0 pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, minus pi, minus 2 pi, minus 3 pi, repeating this pattern over and over. And it has asymptotes at odd multiples of pi over 2. So that's tangent. And now you got to figure out what is the biggest piece of tangent I can put on line y equals x to invert a piece of it. If I want to keep it close to the origin, I'll pick this, right? So as I take that piece and flip it over the line y equals x, you get the inverse tangent. Well, instead of curling around the y-axis, now it curls around the x-axis. Let's put it in the green here, I guess. And by flipping the interchanging the axes, the line x equals minus pi over 2 becomes y equals minus pi over 2. The asymptote x equals plus pi over 2 becomes the asymptote y equals pi over 2. All right, so there is then, then is the graph of tangent and its inverse function, arc tangent. Written either of these two notations. Okay. And you can plot more points by considering special angles. For instance, pi over 4, 1 becomes the point here, 1 pi over 4, halfway up here. Now you can look at the domain and range on this one. What's the domain? Well, it goes on forever in both directions. You can put it in any x value you want. So interesting that the, the uh, arc tangent function has domain all real numbers. You can put uh, minus infinity to infinity that interval. Use the interval notation. Uh, then range all the y values, or we can put it the other notation. It doesn't matter. Uh, minus infinity, less than x, less than infinity. I'll just follow the same notation before. What's the range? The y values, though, can only go between minus pi over 2, that one, and plus pi over 2. Not including the endpoint, right? There's a, it's just by visual inspection for us. Now, just like the inverse sine, inverse cosine, if I take the inverse tangent of the tangent, when do I get x back? When it came from this piece we flipped, right? Which is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And uh, something else otherwise. Right. And if we go the other way, this is the good one tangent of the arc tangent. You can put any number you want into the arc tangent and flip it over, it lands here, part of this one, so it always inverts it. It's always equal to x, it's always defined. This is put minus infinity, less than x, less than infinity. So tangent always undoes arc tangent. 
And then you can find some exact values when they come from special angles, just like with arc sine and arc cosine. And otherwise, you use a calculator. We can find arc tangent x exactly by hand when x is the tangent of a special angle. For instance, this one. What could be the arc tangent of minus the square root of three? Oh, maybe I say to myself before, I've seen a tangent come out minus square root of three. And what happens is that the angles that have, the special angles have tangent that's plus or minus square root three, plus or minus two, plus or minus square root two, let's say plus or minus one and zero. And so if you see one of those numbers, you can do it exactly. Right? Just remembering back to what we got from tangent of the special angles. How do you do this? Same thing again. You ask what angle has this tangent? Except there's an infinite number of answers. If you lay the angle arbitrary, you want the one that's from the inverse tangent. From the picture of the inverse tangent, its range tells you that the answer you get is always between plus and minus minus two, right? So the arc tangent is a unique angle between plus and minus pi over two. You don't include the endpoints like you did with arc sine because right, it doesn't really touch these asymptotes. So the arc tangent of any number is the angle between plus and minus pi over two, and it has that tangent. There's only one of those. Right? And you see it from the graph, right? You put in an X, you get exactly one number between minus pi over two and pi over two. So again, I'll solve it on the unit circle. And this one's a little harder. What I want is what angle has tangent equal to minus square root of three. I'll rewrite it as a quotient, minus square root of three over one. But that's not on the unit circle. I'd like to interpret this as a sine and a cosine, but they're not because they don't lie in the unit circle. So I'll divide top and bottom by the root sum square of those numbers. Square root of minus square root three squared plus one squared to square root of four is two. Then these two coordinates will be on the unit circle minus square root three over two and one half. So I can interpret the top as sine and the bottom as cosine. That's what you do. Right as a quotient, divide by the root sum square. You'll see, oh, that comes from a, okay, that's a point on the unit circle minus square root three over two and a half. Or it could be the other one, it could be square root three over two over minus a half, which is it? It's this one actually, right? This one has y or sine positive and x or cosine negative, so it's over in quadrant two. Tangent we want to come out in quadrant one or four, right? It's between plus and minus 90 degrees. So it's not this one, it's this one. Uh, and so we interpret the sine as minus square root three over two, that's the y coordinate, minus 0.8 something, one half, halfway out, uh, plus one half, halfway out on the x-axis to the end here. We're at this point right here, I should have written this on the other side. And so there's the angle right there. Is put tangent equal quotient, divide top and bottom by the root sum square of those two numbers in the quotient. So we get a point in the unit circle. This is sine, this is cosine, you can figure the angle. You can drop a perpendicular here and notice that this side, since it goes down to minus square root three over two, this triangle has side length square root three over two. Since this side goes from zero to half on the x-axis, the side length is half. It has to be a 30, 60, 90 triangle. But since we went clockwise, it's minus 60 degrees or minus pi over three. There's the answer. The arc tangent of minus square root three is minus pi over three because of this unit circle argument. Seems a little complicated, but actually it's something you can visualize it. 
after a while, you say, oh, minus square root three, looks like minus, right? To make that ratio, it must be minus square root three over two and minus and plus a half. Uh, and then you figure, oh, it's 60 degree angle clockwise. There's four trig functions and a simple example of arc tangent. Finally, the last three functions for the arc cotangent of x. You notice the homework problems don't have much to do with this. They don't actually ask you to calculate an arc cotangent and, uh, and that sort of thing. And those buttons aren't on your calculator either. There is a way to do them, but it's a mess. And they don't make it easy because people don't need them too often. So these last three, not as useful, but let's see what they look like because they do come up in calculus occasionally. For our cotangent of x, or let's say for cotangent of x, we'll find the inverse function by drawing the cotangent function, which looks like this. It crosses at odd multiples of pi over 2 and then asymptotes at uh, integer multiples of pi. Right? So it looked like this. And it's pi periodic. There's the cotangent function. So what piece of this shall we flip? Because that function is evidently intersected more than once by a horizontal line. The convention is to flip this piece. You do the same thing as before. You flip it over the line y equals x. This point pi over 2, 0 becomes the point 0 pi over 2. This asymptote x equals pi becomes an asymptote y equals pi. And the asymptote x equals zero becomes an asymptote y equals zero. This goes down towards the positive y-axis. This one will go down towards the positive x-axis. It looks like this. There is the inverse cotangent. Right. And you can do some similar problems with this. Again, since there's not much homework problem, I just want to introduce it to you. Maybe I'll say identify the graph or something like that. For secant x, this gets even more obscure. Here's the graph of the secant. How do you graph secant? Remember, you block the cosine. Then wherever a cosine crosses its midline, you get an asymptote. You get 1 over 0 is un secant is undefined. But in between, it come, the secant just comes down and touches the peaks and valleys of a cosine function. It's, it's reciprocal, right? There's y equals secant. So what portion of that shall we flip? And here's where the dispute arises. If you look online, you'll see some of them say, well, let's flip uh, oh, I forgot to draw a part of it. <laughs> let's flip this part. We can't do this then because we'll fail the horizontal line test with this part. That's what your textbook does and what most, most math textbooks and calculators do, so we'll stick with that one. However, some of the places you'll see them use this one and this one. And then they'll get a different graph than we do. All right. So we'll say here it is. This is x equals pi over 2. This vertical asymptote flips. And because a horizontal asymptote, y equals pi over 2. You look at the points here. This is a point 0, 1 because the cosine of 0 is 1. So the secant is also. This one at pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. So the secant of pi is also negative 1. They touch there. And we reverse those coordinates. 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. Pi minus 1 becomes minus 1 pi up here. And this line is halfway in between these two. Now what you do is both these come down towards the asymptote. 
And so you draw the inverse that way. This comes down towards the asymptote that direction. This goes up towards the asymptote that direction. There is the usual graph of y equals inverse secant of x. There it is. So there's the inverse secant. I think it's worth seeing. Again, I might ask you to identify the graph. This one has a very strange domain of range. I should do this for the arc cosine tangent while it's up here too. For arc cotangent, what's the domain? Well, it goes out all the, it goes as far as you can go in both directions. You can put in any x, and there's a y back. So the domain is all real numbers again. But the um, is not so, right? You something is making your uh... That means making the video a bit fuzzy. What's, what's fuzzy? It's, some, the video is lost a bit of quality. On the camera? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, great. Um, yeah, we lost the camera right at the end last time. I don't know how much you missed. Um, I have no way of fixing that right now except to shut down the system and restart it. Can you read the lettering still? Otherwise, I have to restart the whole thing. It'll take about five minutes. Can you read this or not? Oh, I can read it. I can read it. Okay, okay. If it gets so bad you can't read, we'll, we can try restarting it probably. Um, all right. So the co arc cotangent has domain, all real numbers, because it goes out as far as you want, but its range only goes from a y value of zero to pi. The secant has a strange domain and range. This one is worth knowing, because uh, it's, it's different. What's the domain? Well, you put in any number from minus one to the left, right? Minus one is the first point, and then it goes out to the left, or from one to the right. So the domain is the interval minus infinity to minus one, including minus one, or you can put a, get a point from one to infinity. How do you include all those points? You put this union sign. Union means all the points here together with all the points here. It means it's in this set or in this set, verbally. So it's got a very strange domain. In the range, you can get any number from zero up to pi, except you can't get pi over two. So we'll say the range is zero up to, but not including pi over two, so I would draw a round bracket. And then from pi over two, not including pi over two, to pi, you need of those two. There's the domain of range for secant, arc secant. If you need the arc secant of a number, it's often easier to do arc cosine. Um, as follows. Let's look at an example. Suppose I want to find the inverse secant of two. I wonder what that is. Why don't I need this inverse secant function? Because uh, what we want is secant of theta equal two, right? We want the angle theta such that secant theta is equal to two. What's secant in this range? Zero to pi over two, union pi over two to pi. So basically from zero to pi, just left one number. Well, instead of solving secant equal two, it's easier to instead of demand to solve uh, cosine theta equal to half by writing reciprocal. Now you can use our cosine, right? Or the unit circle, right? So now you can run to the unit circle and say cosine is the x coordinate. So to find what angle has cosine equal to half, 
This time I draw a vertical line, right? If you want the sine equal to number, the sine is the y coordinates, you draw a horizontal line, y equals that number. But if you want the cosine equal to number, you draw the line, the vertical line, x equals that number. So to get secant equal two, we want cosine equal a half. So we draw x equals a half, and there's two points on the unit circle where x is half, and that's it. There's only two possible terminal regions. Which one do we want? This is why you want to know the range. The one is we want is between zero and pi, but not pi over two. Secant isn't defined at pi over two. Um, so zero to pi is the first and second quadrants. We throw out this one. So it must be this angle here. Now, if it goes over to x equals a half here, then this side length is a half. This is one because it's a unit circle. Ah, square root of three over two must be on this side because I see two sides of a right triangle I memorized. Uh, this is a 60 degree angle, pi over three. So I infer that this arc secant of two is pi over three, not by going through all the calisthenics of the arc secant, but by rewriting as a cosine problem. <laughs> That's easier. And then finally, the inverse cosecant has the same kind of thing. It's very similar. Remember, secant and, uh, secant and cosecant are the same shape, just slid over pi over two units. Remember that? Same picture. That means when I flip them, it's going to be the same deal. It's going to look the same shape as moving over. Uh, here's what we get. Uh, final one. For y equals uh, cosecant x. We remember we can take the sine function that goes between minus one and one, and the cosecant is the U shape up, U shape down that just touches the peaks and valleys. And the asymptotes where the sine is equal to zero, which is integer multiples of pi, and it has this point right here, pi over two one. And this point right here, sine of minus pi over two is minus one. Okay. What piece of that shall we take to inverse? Again, we try and take it close to the origin. And if we can, we'll take it on both sides. And if we can't, we'll go to the right. That's what we do in all of This one we can take on both sides. We can take this piece here and this piece here. Okay. No horizontal line intersects that more than once. I go further, it starts to come down or, or go up here, and I can't keep it one to one. We'll take these pieces right here, flip them over the line y equals x, and now I can plot the points. Minus pi over two minus one becomes minus one minus pi over two. The point pi over two one becomes one pi over two. Pi over two is about 1.5 something. Uh, so this is like one, one and a half roughly. Now, these both head towards the asymptote uh, x equals zero here, right? We flip that over this way and then they must head towards the asymptote y equals zero here. That's how you figure this. Evidently, this one goes out like this. Now this one goes over like this, both of them approaching the asymptote one on each side. There is the inverse cosecant of x. Or arc cosecant of x. How about that? But once again, to find inverse cosecant of angles, you usually use arc sine instead. What is the inverse cosecant uh, of negative one? How about that? Uh -huh. <laughs> what we're asking is what angle theta has this arc cosecant, uh, or has this cosecant? And what range does that, can the angle take on? This is where the picture is nice. It's the range of the function. The domain of the arc cosecant is from minus infinity to minus one. Plus. 
union, 1, x equals 1, to infinity. Those are the only numbers you can put in. If you put in your calculator, aren't cosecant of 0, it will give you an error. There is no function whose cosecant is 0. It can, well, the cosecant can only take on these values less than or equal to minus 1 or bigger than or equal to 1, so the inverse cosecant is fine for numbers other than that. Now the range is all the y values of the pink function here, uh, the green function here. You can have any number between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 except 0, right? It doesn't touch the asymptote. So minus pi over 2 to 0, union 0 to pi over 2. This stuff is hard to memorize, but if you know that graph, then you can figure it out every time, right? If you forget the graph, you can figure it out from this one, right? So that's why we show you all those things. Now we'll say, ah, the range here says the angle has to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 excluding 0. So what angle, uh, this means an element of, an element of this union uh, the minus pi over 2, I did this backwards, this is supposed to be a square bracket here, because you include minus pi over 2, but there isn't one at 0, this is a round bracket on this, and you it the wrong way. And then this is zero round bracket to pi over two square bracket. So we're going to range from minus pi over two to zero union zero to pi over two. What angle in quadrant one or four has this cosecant? It's a hard question. So you turn it around and ask instead, uh, what angle in here has sine theta equal the reciprocal of this, which is also negative 1. Now I've got it, because sine is the y-coordinate. I've sketched the unit circle, and I've sketched the line y equals minus 1 to find all points on the unit circle whose y is minus 1, with y equal minus 1, so the sine is minus 1. It's just tangent, so there's actually only one intersection. The angle I have to have, I might say, is that, but well, that's not right. That's not in this in this range, my, even though it's in quadrant, well, at the edge of quadrant four, uh, not in quadrant four. Uh, it has to be between minus pi over two and zero, or zero and pi over two. It must go the other way. It's this one, pi over two. That has arc cosecant equal negative one. Uh, minus pi over two, excuse me, it's, it's clockwise. So the arc cosecant of negative one is minus pi over two because we can do this in a circle diagram for actually sine. All right. That's all the inverse trig function. How about that? <laughs> like you to be able to do some of those kinds of things. There's lots of problems in there for, for that. Then there's one additional trick. Uh, we said before we can only take inverse trig functions if the number you put in was a, the corresponding trig function of a special angle, right? You had, you had to come from a special angle, or you just did it on the calculator as an approximation. However, so let's say so a an inverse trig function. can be evaluated exactly when the uh, number x is the corresponding trig function of a special angle. Okay. But there's another time you can uh, 
do something similar. But also, and this is kind of surprising, a, even though you can't do the inverse trig function exactly, a trig function of the inverse trig function can be done exactly, always when it's defined. Not the other way around, inverse trig of trig, necessarily. But trig and function of inverse trig function. What's more, it's actually an algebraic expression. It's amazing. You think you take a trig function, you get some mass that can't possibly be algebra, and then you take another inverse trig function, uh, some other inverse trig function, you think you get some terrible mass, but it's actually a simple algebraic expression. Uh, a trig function of an inverse trig function. In that order, can be evaluated for any number for which it's defined. Exactly. So bear that in mind. Even if you don't see a special angle, you can do these. And I want to do this by example rather than writing out the strategy. You'll see the strategies would go, but I think by the time I explain it, it's more of a mess than a help. Suppose I wanted to find the inverse tangent of the cosine, I'm sorry, I wrote it backwards, the cosine of the inverse tangent. Uh, of three fourths. What could that be? Oh, three fourths doesn't come from a special angle, right? It's not the tangent of any special angle, so it looks like maybe I can't do it. But here's what you do. It's a three step method. One, you uh, sketch a right triangle uh, with theta equal the inverse trig function you see. Whatever it is, FCN for function. So let's do that for this one. Here's the right triangle. You don't have to sketch it accurately. I'll just put theta here. It doesn't matter which acute angle you attach to theta either. You just make a right triangle, put theta at one of these. Now I want theta equal the inverse tangent of three fourths. Right. So I take the tangent of each side, and in a triangle, this, the tangent always undoes the inverse tangent. And I got that means the tangent theta is three fourths. Tangent theta equals three fourths means that I can make this the opposite side and this the adjacent side. If I put three here and four here, then the tangent of this angle is three fourths. Theta is the arc tangent of three fourths. Right. That's the first step. Now you don't have to use three and four. You could do thirty and forty or six and eight. Anything that's ratio is three fourths. It works just as well. I put these because these are the smallest numbers I can do, and I'd rather work with small numbers and less chance of mistake, right? So. Step two, then, is to find the last side by the Pythagorean theorem. What is the hypotenuse if I know the two legs? All right, it's the root sum square, right? The, the formula solved for C is square root A squared plus B squared. So C, the last side here, is square root A squared, 4 squared, plus B squared, 3 squared. Square root of 25 is 5. Oh, it's a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. That's a pretty easy one. Generally, you get square roots on these sides. We'll do that in the next example. This one kind of happens to come from a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. Um, now, step three, you use to evaluate the expression, the original expression, using the triangle.
That's it. So our triangle with the inverse trig function that's there on the last side by the Pythagorean theorem is the triangle. Here's how it works. Uh, I want the cosine of the arc tangent of three fourths. Cosine arc tangent three fourths. Well, I made theta the arc tangent of three fourths, so it's cosine theta. Huh? But cosine theta is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse, which is four divided by five. There it is, the exact answer is four fifths. The cosine of the arc tangent of three fourths is four fifths. This always works uh, when it's defined. There are some cases, however, where you don't have to draw the triangle because it's a quadratic angle. And there are, uh, there's always the case of maybe you get a negative number. If there's a negative number, how do you put it on the side of a triangle? Um, there's a little bit of cleverness to that. I'll mention this way that covers most of the cases. If you look at those graphs we just did, and I'm not, you know, I meant to put these up here too. Let me turn the camera over here real quick. While I'm thinking about it. There was the graph of the arc sine and the arc cosine. Let's get some high, high accuracy pictures here for the other ones. Uh, if you scroll down the page here, here's the arc tangent, arc cotangent. Just like the trig functions, these are the same shape. If you take the arc tangent function, flip it upside down, and slide it up pi over two, it gives you the arc cotangent. That's because the arc, that's because the cotangent was gotten by sliding it horizontally pi over two and flipping it upside down. You can get the arc cotangent, inverse cotangent, by sliding this one vertically and flipping it upside down. Anyway, so these are actually the same shape, the arc cotangent and the arc tangent. This one goes between minus pi over two and pi over two. This one between zero and pi. Uh, and then finally, so that's what I was trying to draw. Here are the uh, inverse secant or arc secant and inverse cosecant to draw the way I did them before. Uh, so root of pi, leave out pi over two, or minus pi over two to pi over two, leave out zero. For the blue ones. Okay, so I just wanted to show those off to show uh, comparison with what I drew. Now, with note, uh, if you look, at the arc sine function or the arc tangent function. There's an interesting graphing property they have. That's true of the inverse of any odd function. Do you see what it is? What graphing property they have? What symmetry do they have? Do they align to the symmetry they have? Symmetry through the origin, right? This point corresponds to a point here, this one to a point here. It's symmetric through the origin. These are both odd functions. In fact, the inverse of any odd function is an odd function always. So it's not true for in even functions. The inverse of an even function is necessarily even. But the inverse of an odd function is odd. What that means is that if you take the arc sine, I'll write it with the other notation, of negative x, the minus comes out and you get minus the arc sine of x. That can be really useful, right? If you take the arc tangent of minus x, the minus comes out is minus the arc tangent of plus x. Not so for the arc cosine, but that's two thirds of the battle, right? So, um, now that means I can do something like this. What is the cosine of the arc sine uh, of 0.7 exactly? 
Well, as I said, find this exact terminus again, and I might. This one can be found exactly, just find that it's not from a special angle. Remember, trig function of inverse trig function, you can still find exactly using a triangle. Except I forgot my main point here, minus 0.7. I want to do it for negative, that's why I put this up here for me. How can I put a negative 0.7 in a triangle side, right? There's supposed to be positive length. What you can do is this, use your odd property and say this is the cosine of minus the arc sine of plus 0.7, right? Because sine is odd, uh, arc sine is odd. Now the cosine of minus an angle is what? Cosine is an even function. This is an arc cosine, it's cosine. Cosine is even, the minus goes away. There it is. Instead of calculating the cosine of the arc sine of minus 0.7, I can just calculate the cosine of the arc sine of plus 0.7. Easy. Now it's on a triangle, right? Wait a minute, how do I put 0.7 in here? Let's try the three steps again, right? Like doing the tango or something. One, two, three. <laughs> uh, one, you uh, write theta equals the inverse trig function you see. In this case, arc sine of 0. 0.7. And put that in a right triangle, right? I'll pick this angle with theta. I like to put it down there. It's a habit, I guess. How can I make theta the arc sine of 0.7? Well, I take the sine of each side. What I need is sine theta equal 0.7 of the triangle, right? So I can put 0.7 here and one here, and that works. So the opposite over hypotenuse is 0.7. But what's even easier? I'm going to put 7 and 10, right? So 7 tenths is 0.7. Then I get rid of the fractions and the <laughs> decimals, right? So let's do that in step one. Step two, uh, now I find the last side by the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagoras says, when you're missing a leg, it's the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the leg squared. So you get the hypotenuse, it's the root sum of the squares, and you're getting a leg, it's the square root of the Hypotenuse squared minus the other leg squared. So 10 squared minus 7 squared is 100 minus 49. It's 51. Square root of 51, that's what you usually get. I picked a cooked example last time. <laughs> Even with this not so bad one, I make an exercise on the triangle. Still, I get a square root of a mass. I get a square root mass. <laughs> uh, so, but the last side then is, is square root of 51. Now, I simply evaluate. The trig function, the inverse trig function, cosine of arc sine of 0.7, the one I converted it to, by uh, saying, oh, that's cosine theta, because I made it that way, right? Theta is the arc sine. But cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. That would be square root 51 over 10. There is the exact value. You can take it as many decimal places as you want. You've got a computer that will do it. Of uh, the uh, cosine of the arc sine of minus 0.7. And amazingly, every time it just comes out to be an algebraic expression with a square root like that. Here's the one I really like. This is what shows you that it works no matter what number you put in. Let's try this one. What is the arc tangent? of the sine of x, any number, right? Sine is defined for all numbers, right? Oops, I wrote it backwards, that's all right. Tangent of the arc sine. It has to be trig function on the outside, not inverse trig on the inside. Uh, so now, for any number for which the arc sine is defined, this will work, right? Because I let x be arbitrary. I do the three steps again. I'll say one, let theta equal the arc sine, the inverse trig function I see. The triangle that means sine theta equals x. And I draw it this way, theta, and I use the same tricks as before. X can also be written as x over 1. 
Well, I'm going to interpret this as the opposite, and this is the hypotenuse. Or I can make it 2x over 2 or something like that. We'll just put x and 1. Now the sine of theta is x, right? Now I'm going to get a general expression for the uh, tangent of the arc sine of x. The last side now, uh, by the Pythagorean theorem, what is this? It's a leg, so it's square root of hypotenuse squared minus the other leg squared. Oh, it's just square root 1 minus x squared. Huh. Finally, what's the tangent of the arc sine of x? Well, it's the tangent of theta because I drew it that way, right? What's the tangent of theta? Opposite over adjacent. Let's say it's x over square root 1 minus x squared. And there it is. The tangent of the arc sine of any number of x is nothing more than this algebraic expression, x over square root 1 minus x squared. Amazing, isn't it? The trig function, inverse trig function is always an algebraic expression, no matter what x you put in. So uh, that kind of makes you think for a while, doesn't it? But there it is. You can take a tangent of arc sine of whatever expression like that just by making a triangle. All right. That's probably a good stopping point. Uh, we're just about to the end. Any questions on all this? Uh, anything not clear? I'd like you to try all the problems out of that section. I think it's 11 in there. There's some applied problems, but I probably need a little more time than we have to do them. Maybe we can do one real quick. I don't know. Yeah, just a couple minutes. Uh, but it's uh, 6.3. One through, I think it's 11. Yeah, one through 11. Now let's try one simple one. There is one simple applied problem we can do. This is just to show the utility of them. We've actually done one kind of like this before in the other section. Um, example, I'm, I'm gonna abbreviate it. It says there's an isosceles triangle that has two sides equal to 10. And the base equal to eight. Right? Find the angle theta in degrees. So we'll do one problem in degrees today. How about that? Um, what is it? I have a, this is my condensed version of the problem. What you can do, since it's isosceles, you can drop a perpendicular here. This is where you want to have some intuition, too. This is why we drew the applied problem, to figure out what you apply this to. And if I drew this correctly, these two links should be the same, right? By symmetry, this is 4 and this is 4, right? Now I'm asking myself, what's that angle theta? Well, I noticed that cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. All right, cosine theta equals four over 10, which reduces to two fifths. So the angle, since it's in a triangle, must be the inverse cosine. Remember the inverse cosine, I can take the inverse cosine of a cosine. And what is that? It's taking the inverse cosine of both sides. Since theta is an acute angle, it's in the first quadrant, and in the first quadrant, all the inverse trig functions undo the trig function. That's what we said. So uh, this must be theta is, is the arc cosine of, three, of two fifths. And now I just have to cal put my calculator in degrees mode, and it will tell me what that angle is. Mode. Good. Inverse cosine, so I push second cosine because the inverse button is above it, right? Of uh, 0.4 is two fifths. And I get 66.42 degrees approximately, at least I'm rounding it. All right. 
So there's one of the utilities. You can figure angles and structures very easily with these inverse trig marks. But a lot of times it's not what's the sine of that angle or cosine of the angle. It's what angle has that cosine because you measure these, but maybe you don't know what the angle is exactly. All right. That's a good stopping point. Then uh, we'll pick it up from there next time. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.